Thank you, Jeanette. I want to just run through some slides quickly, just a few minutes to um, tell you a little bit about the research in a way to answer this question, why is complicated grief important, and also why this is this center important. This is, um, I'll begin with what I'm calling the critical perspective. This was actually uh, an earlier view about bereavement and complicated grief, and actually one I endorse. This is a quote from a paper I wrote in 2001 with Stacy Kaltman, in which we were arguing that it wasn't really necessary to have a particular diagnosis for grief. Uh, and I'll read this to you. According to the DSM-4, bereavement is a stressor event that warrants a clinical diagnosis only in extreme cases when other DSM categories of psychopathology, like major depression or PTSD, are evident. In this article, the article that this came from, we review empirical evidence on the longitudinal course, phenomenological features, and possible diagnostic relevance of grief reactions. Then we concluded that the evidence was generally consistent with the view, with the DSM's view of bereavement, and that individuals showing chronic grief reactions could be relatively easily accommodated by existing diagnostic categories, major depression or PTSD. And that's really, I think, an opinion I held at the time pretty clearly. I thought, well, that makes sense to me. But unfortunately, it didn't, or fortunately, I should say, it, it didn't really hold up. For example, uh, a number of reviews began to appear showing that grief treatments were generally not effective. And one of these appeared after another in quick succession, and that really got a lot of attention. If, if one review appears, says grief treatments are not effective in the academic community, the, the mental health community will wonder about it. But one after another was saying it's really not effective. And one of the reasons seemed that re they really weren't the right treatments. They were not targeting grief symptoms. They were targeting either depression or PTSD. So uh, I was on a number of panels, and we, we really began to think about this. So we re decided to ask the question empirically, are grief symptoms clinically relevant? Is there more to grief than depression and PTSD? And in the language, the research language, we would say does grief have incremental validity? If we have depression and we have PTSD trauma reactions, do we need anything more? Do we need something called grief to explain those things? So we came up with a number of different studies. This is the design of one. Um, so it, it, soon after the loss, a few months after the loss, we had people uh, go through a structured interview. We measured depression, we measured PTSD symptoms, trauma symptoms, and grief symptoms. Then we had people rated independently by clinicians for their functioning. We did that again in another interview. We had their friends rate how they, they were doing. We looked at their heart rate responsivity when they talked about the loss, et cetera. And then we repeated this again a little over a year later. So we had lots of different measures. This was actually a fairly rigorous way to test this. So does grief symptoms, the idea of grief, bias anything? Well, the answer was resounding. Yes, 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 yes on all fronts. And this was, as I said, a fairly rigorous test. So we found that grief symptoms predicted current and future adjustment. They predicted heart rate response. They predicted what their, how their friends thought people were doing over and above depression and PTSD. This was really strong evidence. And I was kind of amazed by this really said, wow, there is something that's in grief that is not in these other disorders. So we did it in another study. We found the same thing in another study with a new sample, different measures. You know, we, we really tried to do this as scientifically rigorously as we could, and we found, again, the same thing. The other thing that emerged, so we know there's something unique about grief that's not depression and PTSD. The other thing that was beginning to emerge was that treatments were actually more effective when they were targeting grief symptoms and targeting prolonged grief, giving people some time to get it better on their own and then finding out who was not functioning well. And uh, Dr. Shear did a study in 2005 in JAMA, published in JAMA, that really was the first major study that targeted bereavement, grief symptoms specifically with a treatment designed for that. And this was really big news because it said, all right, there is something we can get at. We can help people by specifically targeting grief. So in a lot of the research I do, as um, Jeanette mentioned, we study resilience, we study other prototypical trajectories. We follow people over time, large groups of people, and map their outcomes. And we've done this with war, we've done this with all kinds of events, and a lot of this research with bereavement. So we have these different patterns of outcome that we can map. Some people are resilient, some people recover, some people show more complicated reactions. Here's an example of one of those studies published in 2002. This was a large population sample that we followed for about seven years, and we had measures before and after. This is depression, but we also did this with grief symptoms. And you can see there is a group there 
that just doesn't get any better. They're, not, they're doing fine before the loss, and then they, they, they get worse, and they, they're not able to get better. So when we have these kinds of patterns, then the question becomes, so what's going on? What causes these different groups to, to branch out like this? Why doesn't everybody get better the same way? And this is why a center like this is so important, because we can begin to try to answer that question. So everybody's trying to adapt to loss, and some people are doing it better than others. So we've been looking at uh, emotion regulation, something we call emotion regulation flexibility. This is a project we're doing in my lab across the street. There are lots of streets that people talk about being across. Of. We're talking about that one over there. Um, and um, we're doing part of this in collaboration with Dr. Shear and, and an intervention studies, and we're doing it also in many other ways. And it's based on the idea that ad adapting to these aversive life events requires flexibility. This is a, uh, uh, an emergent idea. And we've identified three components of flexibility, being sensitive to the context, having a repertoire of responses, and being able to monitor feedback. And this is the same thing as what I had just described, but I'll show you graphically. So we have a stressor event, in this case a loss. This impinges upon us. Something happens to us and we are now thrown off or disequilibriated. So we have to appraise what this means. What is this demanding of us? What do we have to do to recover from this event? And people vary in how well they can do this. So we call this context sensitivity. Then after people make those appraisals, they have to enact a strategy. They have to decide how they're going to respond to this kind of event. And people vary in their ability to do that as well. So we call this repertoire. Some people have a much more elaborate repertoire of coping responses than others. Some people, you know, sometimes we need to express emotions, sometimes we need to suppress emotion, or talk or not talk, or seek help or not seek help, or just grin and bear it, whatever the, the, the situation might recover. And then once we enact a strategy, we need to monitor it. We need to find out how is this working? Is this doing what we hoped it would do? And should we maintain the strategy, adapt, adjust it, try something new, et cetera. And we do this in a, a long-term event like bereavement. We do this over and over and over. We repeat this cycle many times. So what we found in our, in our laboratory research, early on, people who are not as sensitive to the context, and we can measure this experimentally, are more likely to show that complicated grief pattern, whereas people who are more sensitive are more likely to recover. And then later on, we're finding that people who already have developed complicated grief who, are, who lack a repertoire of coping responses, those are the people that will continue to suffer. So this is just the beginning of this kind of research. It took 10 years to do it, but it's just the beginning. Um, and there's a lot of work that can be done. So this, this kind of work, which I'm going through very quickly, just to give you a flavor of it, is why this kind of center is so important. Because we can do this kind of basic research. There's intervention happening in an ongoing way, and we can interface, we can reach out to the community, and there's that kind of collaboration. And those things, bring, bringing those things together in one place is so important because this is a big public health problem. People are resilient, and I have said this many times, but not everybody is resilient, and people need help. When they need help, they need help. And we really need to understand why, um, why certain courses are followed and what we can do about it. So this center, uh, I think, is really important in that regard. Thank you.